Welcome everyone to the Lidation Open Source Summit. Hello, welcome everyone to the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit. My name is Kathy Jory. I'm streaming to you uh, live from San Diego this morning. Actually, I don't live in San Diego, but uh, happen to be visiting down here. So I'm going to talk to you about today about um, the privacy implications and security of running a smart home. So hopefully some of you out there have, have checked it out. There's a lot of convenience and physical security and, and things that are nice about smart home equipment, but there's a lot of things to watch out for as well. Um, I worked for a couple, a little over two years on the project at um, Mozilla uh, that was an attempt to build standards-based uh, through the web smart home um, project. It really is successful. It really works great. And that's what I'm going to be demonstrating today. So the do-it-yourself, even though I'm working as a volunteer right now in a, on the project leadership committee of Microblocks, I still do a lot of support in Mozilla uh, project as well. So we're right in. And, um, and I have some links on this main page that uh, takes you to microblocks.fun, iot.mozilla.org. During the slide as well. And uh, after I go through a few slides to introduce the things, I'm actually going to play a pre-recording that I took at my own home for some of the smart home equipment that I have there so you can see what what I have in this slide, which is a little video uh, of what's going on there. So well, I want to explain what's what's different and what's similar. Oh, no, this, sorry. Before I go into that, I wanted to mention an online tutorial. Um, and it is free and open to the public. I've, I, I wrote up this to, to some other talks I've been giving to universities, uh, IEEE chapters, and so forth so they could do a walkthrough of the Web of Things gateways and some of the more popular things you can do with it. So this online tutorial, I'll try to put a link in the chat funk at the Q&A session. Um, so that's the tutorial online for you. And then I want to jump into thinking about um, you know, what's important to you. Uh, security is important to all of us. And whenever you pretty much when talks about security, security, security. But I would argue more security uh, for now, privacy. Like all the things that are going to your home when you open and close the door, lights turn on, it's being streamed through your, you know, your video cameras. Do you really want to share that with all the companies, especially the big, big titans? And that's where I'd say, mm, no. You know, there's certain things to share. My washing machine broke, and there's some diagnostic information. I should be able to actively opt in and say, okay, I'm pushing this diagnostic data to the manufacturer of my, of my smart dishwasher, whatever. And that's, that's an acceptable use of sharing, sharing the data. And then thirdly, interoperability. Like, I cannot tell you how disappointing it is to be locked into one ecosystem or one protocol or whatever. Um, and there's so many things out there and they're so ubiquitous already that the whole idea of the web of things is saying the internet of things is the things that's not gonna change and people are, are adopted it. But how make things interoperable at a higher layer? Well, that's to IoT data, express it in a format readable JSON as properties, actions, and events, publish that as web services, the same as web services you use for else. And now suddenly I can have, you know, this push button from Samsung control this outlet from IKEA. You know, so suddenly I can make these interoperable because this has a event of push, double push, long press, and this has an on-off property so I can Make maybe the press turn it on and the double press turn it off. And I use these for like the buttons for dimmable bulbs from IKEA and so forth. So that's the interoperability phase is you don't have to make the hardware know about each other, but you got to make them intersect at a higher level. So how does that happen? 
basically with the W3 web standard. It's just like, like we communicate over web sockets and HTTP at a higher layer and all the Zig Z wave, uh, you know, Bluetooth, HomeKit, Weave, whatever it is, communications can go on as it does today. You just have to get that stuff networked to some of a web server that ties it all together. And that's what we're going to talk about today with the gateway is this becomes uh, on a Raspberry Pi, this becomes the hub of it all running the web server. So at, eventually you, you bring all the data to an IP. And uh, the beauty of the project at Mozilla, the WebThings gateway, because it runs this Raspberry Pi, here I have one with an LED strip, here I have one and a nice little bottom OK do, because there's just released a kit where you can buy this with the micro SD card. You know, you flash a micro SD card and you can buy it pre-flashed for, for this kit and turn it into your home gateway just like that. That's kind of nice. So the thing is, all of the data runs here. And now we have uh, we have an old voice, um, local voice system that runs, like I plug in to one of the USB ports, uh, a job or speaker microphone, and I can do voice commands. And those voice commands don't ever leave this box. In other words, there's no cloud backing this up right now. There's no cloud backing up the data. There's no cloud backing up the voice or processing the voice. There's no cloud processing any of the, the smart home data that goes on on the gateway. So that's the big difference between the Mozilla smart home approach and industry, where industry, every time you you buy another you know smart thing from somebody, you download their app, you set it up on the network with their nap, app. And Mozilla's approach, once you get it on your network, you can usually throw the app away. Um, keep it just in case factory reset, but pretty much after that, it all communicates locally for most devices. And then there are battery operated devices like this little Xiaomi motion sensor. Uh, this happens to be Zigbee. So what happens when you have Zigbee and Z-Wave devices is that you need to buy a dongle. Here I have a Z-Wave dongle, and here I have a Zigbee dongle. Uh, for Zigbee, I usually use uh, this Conbee 2 dongle from, from uh, Dresden Electronics. And so then, in the typical vendor approach, all your data goes to the cloud. In these approaches, it all goes to your Raspberry Pi. Um, and then, basically, what you wind up with is your own private smart home, where the gateway and all the things connected to it, the WebThings gateway, is in your home. You can buy all of these devices devices, which a lot of my home for convenience, these little battery upgrade ones are nice, but you can also make your own. And I'm going to be demonstrating a really fun project, Microblocks, where I can turn these into, into web things quite easily. All these microcontroller things. It's a really, really powerful project. And then what does that result in? You build and buy. I mean, you can do a combination of both. It results in your own privacy. So you you can do a, a floor layout view or just I usually use the icon view. And that's what we're going to be demonstrating um, shortly. Okay, so now I mentioned the fact that you can build your own web things. And it's a really powerful thing for education and for just makers do it yourself. So what I'm going to show next Actually, one more thing. So the WebThings framework is, okay, if this is your hub and these things, then how do your things produce Web of Things standard-based um, data? Well, sometimes they don't. You know, this thing is a Zigbee device. What happens is the gateway hosts what's called an add-on, and the community has helped build boatloads of add-ons that run here and they basically do the bridging from whatever the thing speaks, say Zigbee. Um, in this case, it's just, uh, I could do the, I could do a, a radio link, proprietary radio link, or I could do just the USB and plug it straight into the hub. Whatever the add-on is, it basically bridges all the data to the WebThing API. So you can see these frameworks that are written in Node, in Python, MicroPython, Rust, um, and one of them is Microblocks. It's not listed here, but it's one of the third-party libraries 
of which there are a whole bunch of them. So the schemas, it's important to know the schemas are at iot.mozilla.org slash schemas, and all of these frameworks are available um, on, the, on the website. So let's, let's just show you, if I were to use this and this and turn this into a web thing for the Web Things Gateway, the minimum I would need is I could, I could load the Microblocks IDE, which I will demonstrate during the demo period, and I just give it a name, a capability. This is going to be a smart light, a property of on-off. It can have multiple properties. It could have dimmability. It could have brightness. Um, but just the simple thing is on-off. I start the little web thing server. Um, and then I basically have a set user LED function that turns on and off an LED. And I could have a button press turn on and off the LED. Or I go to my web browser and I can turn on and off the LED. And that web browser can be on your smartphone, a tablet, um, just your laptop, any browser. So you're not stuck to uh, specific uh, smartphone apps. You can use any browser. And what does that look like? So the way that Microblocks works is behind the Microblocks, there's actually opcodes and, and other information. So the, the thing, description in JSON becomes this huge long string that describes the properties, actions, and events of the thing I make. So here's just a list of the types of capabilities that are in the Mozilla IoT schema, the types of properties, and the types of events. So the, the block makes that are to uh, basically a, like assembly language readable code. And those are converted into machine code that are actually running on a virtual machine on the, on the board. For common boards like the Circuit Playground Microbit, when you plug it into the Microbox IDE, it will download the virtual machine for you. But if you have some random uh, other microcontroller and you can get a virtual machine running for it, then uh, Platform IO can do all sorts of, you know, lets you build the virtual machine. It's all 100% open source, education free, and you can build um, virtual machines for other hardware. Okay, guess what? It's demo time. So uh, hopefully this will work where I'm going to jump to my next slide Let's start with and my be able to play it. Here's the office light. I can turn on with a button. One press, double press turns it off. I can also just, you know, click any of these icons to turn it on. If you're actually hearing this, because I'm not hearing it. And I can uh, do a long press to go full brightness. These are just some rules I have set up. So let's go around the house and check out what else we have. Next, we're going to wander into the laundry and check out my smart home camera. See this camera right here? That's the view it has out. Now, if we actually go to the home cam, we can compare the snapshot of what the camera sees. Pretty slick, eh? Better move this so I can close this. And in this... Uh, in this uh, laundry, I also have a very tiny Xiaomi temperature sensor. You can see it tells me the temperature. All right. There's a streaming function you can also do with the camera, but I'm not going to do that right now. Then we're going to head out to the front door. And right hidden behind my little bench, I have an IKEA button. Buttons are useful for a lot of things. Uh, let's see, what, what's going to happen when we open the door? There's my door sensor right there. And it's active or not active. Now we're going to go out and see that right outside the front door, we have a Xiaomi um, motion sensor. So the porch is active, porch motion. And then right down here, we have 
a string of LEDs. This might be hard to see. Uh, we're going to use the button to turn on the LEDs. And, uh, let's see. and then you can also change the color. Let me just see what's going on here. These should be it's so bright out here. I can't see the garden. There's the LEDs. And then different uh, button presses will change the garden color to different colors. And you can see the different colors. Leave that on for a moment. We'll head in. And I'll just show you the hub of all these things is what's called the Web Things Gateway. So we're going to head over into the TV area, and you see that the TV area motion sensor just triggered. And I'm going to show you this little table I have set up a bunch of things for the demo, but here's the Raspberry Pi with the Zigbee adapter. It's plugged into a speaker microphone, a Jabra off-the-shelf speaker mic. There's a Google Home that does announcements for me. I'm going to show you what kind of announcements. This is a leak sink uh, leak detector that's normally under the sink. So if it got wet, there's a rule. Let's see, I've got to scroll down here. You see the leak just went wet. And then every minute and a half, it should trigger the Google Home to do an announcement. I'll show you the Google Home right here has this leak detector thing. And uh, you can also do random announcements. Check under the sink for possible leak. So that's what just happened um, when, uh, when this got wet. So I'll let it dry off. And it only does that while the thing is, is wet. Check under the sink. Check under the sink for possible leak. OK, so now this should dry. And uh, again, if I just show you the Google Home, um, hello, Linux Foundation, I'll show you how this works. Submit query. Hello, Linux Foundation conference attendees. All right, and now what, what is this little uh, uh, speaker microphone here for? It's good for turning uh, things on and off with your voice. So I'm going to say, hey, Snips, turn on the music. And if you note, it actually just turned the Sonos to playing, and it's streaming Radio Swiss Jazz. So hopefully you can see hear that. Hey, Snips. Set the music to 60%. And then it will do those things. Now we're going to walk over. I'll probably uh, turn off the music for now. We're going to go over to this entry door. And you see here I have a Samsung SmartThings door sensor. And if I open this, you see the entry door. Go on and off. That's very convenient. This is the main door that we come in, in and out of the garage. OK, I need to get that thing to dry out. And then down here, we have, uh, I just set up my study and my coffee button and lamp. And we're going to just uh, see, let's see, where's the coffee? Now the leak is still showing wet. Here's the coffee button. And you can see that I just, I don't have the coffee plugged into it, but you can use buttons to turn things on and off. And so I did a triple click to turn it off. And then I have this lamp. Hey, Snips, turn on the study. And you can see, even though I'm all the way across the room, I can still turn on this light. Hey, Snips, turn the study to blue. Pretty cool, huh? And then uh, I can, uh, there's a string of lights outside. 
and it's this string right here. And we're going to turn on that string just with a light, with just with the web, since I can't hear it from here. Let's see, where is it? Right here. And hopefully you can see that string of lights go on. And then there's also the back deck motion sensor right here inside that, you see that little Ikea motion sensor. Come back in and we'll say, hey Snips, turn everything off. It might not have caught me. Hey Snips, turn everything off. Oops, I still have to get the leaf to dry up. It's still wet. Hey Snips, turn everything off. There we go. And now there's like uh, just a couple more things I want to show you really quickly. And one is the, uh, the convenience of having temperature and sensor. So like I said, some of these smart things sensors have temperature sensors in them. So we're going to check out this upper deck sensor. Let's see if I tip it up there. And you can see that it when it opens, it triggers the fan right next to it to go on because there's a rule that says when the upper deck temperature is greater than 23, then turn on the fan. And so the, uh, the fan for the outlet just went on. That's a Samsung Smart Things button. And then I just want you to show you here, this is just an IKEA outlet plugged in outside and because we're in California uh, the weather's nice enough that this has just been outside you know all year round and lastly let me just show you the temperature here it is uh, right now 25 degrees Celsius not a bad day eh? and the rest of it I will do in real time at the show bye Okay, it looks like I'm back. All right, I was watching a little bit of the chat. Um, so uh, in addition to the learn more, the first thing I'm gonna do is screen share with you all so that I can do a little bit more in depth of the, um, a little bit more in depth of the gateway. So I'm going to share my screen and here we are. So hopefully this will switch in and and you can see my screen all right starting with uh, for example just out front i can click on this little screen and see that yay verily the car is still there and uh you know, just see what's out front and uh, you can do a video um encoding through the raspberry pi but i run raspberry pi 4 this when you turn on the stream it takes quite a bit of chugging I have this all running on a Raspberry Pi now. Um, there's uh, I use pulses to turn on and off things. And so let me just describe to you what a pulse is. It's basically under the add-ons, you can set as many pulses as you want. It's a type of add-on right here where if I configure, I have a, a pulse called a house and I have a pulse called everything and I've inverted the everything pulse so that I can use my voice to say, turn. Community everyone. And so I have a pulse house that turns everything on, another one called everything that turns everything off. This is just uh, an Ikea, um, 
desk a smart bulb you know that I can set the brightness and I have this tied to a uh, um, a button one of these Samsung smart things buttons and uh, single press turns it on double press turns it off long press turns 100% so I don't, I don't want to repeat everything I did in the recorded video but uh, for example the Sono speaker has all sorts of things you can do um, but there's almost too much going on behind the scenes, so it's better that I tie a virtual uh, dimmer switch. This is a this music button is really a virtual switch, and then I can use my voice with it, or I could use the browser, and I can just click on the music by clicking the icon, just like this button here. I just turn it on. If I want to change the color, I can go in here and change to a specific color or some sort of you know pretty pink whatever it is and yay verily it will be turning those things on um, before i jump into too many of the other uh, demos in here i want to show you logging which is extremely powerful in my opinion so believe it or not from uzbekistan and so i can i can look in there and see you know when did the door that you go in and out you know, last opened, you know, recently, um, within the last hour. And I can look at when things open and close over the course of a week. And you can see that, you know, somebody's around a lot because we're all stuck inside, right, or stuck close to home. Uh, when we're back in the, you know, two people in the family go off to work and come back, if this type of data of when things open and close are in the wrong hands, then people know, you know, that those empty hours, occurring on a daily weekly ba um, daily basis throughout the work week would tell people when to break in. You can also see from the motion sensors and uh, you know the front door we go in and out less often. Um, all of these Samsung battery operated motion sensors, leak detectors, everything have temperature and I just find it exceedingly interesting to watch uh, temperatures you know over the course of of a week. So this is a Xiaomi temp sensor in the laundry. It's a smart thing button in the office there. And I have an add-on of just open weather map uh, API data that pulls in so you can see the temperature outside and then you can see the variations, you know, of a temperature sensor that's by the window. It's pretty, you know, it matches the outside. You can see that over the last couple of days the temperature went way down. Um, earthquakes are something that are extremely interesting to watch from California. And in fact, I have uh, where announcements occur when it's over 5.0. So within the last week, you see that there was a 5.8 and a 6.1, I believe. Um, it, was, it was pretty far away, like 394 kilometers away from my house. I didn't feel it, but it's really kind of interesting to watch these data. My porch sensor is this Xiaomi one is very sensitive to wind of a bush that's nearby that flaps. So it's not really as a good of a motion sensor as it is a, a wind detector. But you know, <laughs> you can use things for different purposes. This uh, is a Ikea motion sensor. I don't have one here, but it points at the back deck. Um, I go riding, uh, uh, rowing out in the bay so I can see the tide in Redwood City. Again, this is internet data that is being brought into my home. So you filter it specific to your, to your interests and your locations. You know, normally you have to go out to the internet and fetch information from different places. This, this brings it all to you, which is quite convenient. This garden lights in the front, I have turning on at sunset and turning off at 10 p.m. every day. So it seems like someone's home, whether we're there or not. Uh, and I still have the ability manual override, of course. This is that leak detector that, um, Something funky happened when I got it wet and it didn't, uh, I actually had to like pop out the battery and plug it back in and it was, it was fine after that. But the sink detector rarely goes off. Like I've only had it go off once for real in this instance where somebody was putting a can or bottle or something in the back recycling under the sink and accidentally spilled some water that got the leak detector wet and yay verily it went off and let me know. So it's kind of convenient to have that. Uh, Google Home announcement, and I get a Slack message, and if I'm at my computer, I get a browser message. And then my upper deck um, door sensor, another Samsung one, 
has a temperature sensor in it and when it opens up when i open it up in the evening to cool off the house we don't have air conditioning it automatically turns on the fan next to the to the screen door if it's above 23 degrees celsius um, you can change your units and so forth to imperial units but i'm i'm very much a metric flan, fan um, this is where everything lives like in my house on a floor plan and i i put on the side buttons that don't really relate to uh, um, things that are physically located, but the office light, you know, as you saw that I had turned that on, I can turn it back off again. Um, you know, this is where the Google Home and the Sonos and the doors and everything lives, so you can turn things on and off. And this is the outside light string. So it's kind of fun to be able to, I know where things are. Some simple rules to start says here's my office button if I press it once turn on the office light easy peasy same button double press turn the office light off same button 100% so you know with three simple rules I can do that here's my virtual button for the music button turns to speaker on um, i could do a whole bunch of pulses to like change setting, setting uh, and say ray assist jazz to kqed or something like that i also have like the volume there isn't a, a complete track of this level to that level in the rules that's tricky so i do a like greater than 50 percent um set the volume high and less than 50 percent set the volume low that seems to work pretty well for me and then just a whole bunch of other buttons that turn things on and off um, and here's the uh for example illuminate things at sunset so i have a front office desk lamp um, you know when i was working out of the house it was nice in the winter it gets dark early and to make it look like someone is home this little office lamp would come on and there's a shade in that front bedroom so it looked like somebody's working in that office. Also the front garden lights would come on at sunset. And uh, this sun, this uh, event sunset at, at my location is based on the date time add-on, which is extremely convenient. In fact, just before I jump back into the rules, I just wanna show you the date time add-on. So you can set rules based on you know, like the leak detector will go every even minute. It will it will make that announcement to me until I make the thing dry again or turn off the rule. You can also disable the rules. But behind this has, has sunset and sunrise and stuff. So let's just go back to that rule a second. And you can see the drop downs here. You know, is it a weekend? Is it not a weekend? Even hours, minutes, dark, not dark. You know, other logic, sunset, sunrise. Um, all sorts of things you can do. So this this rule was uh, sunset, so we'll leave it like that. And then um, the next rule was those same lights go off at 10 p.m. These are the motion ones. So because the porch, porch motion was so active with a nearby bush uh, blowing in the wind, you can see I have disabled that porch motion um, thing. But otherwise I had it would I have it do tell you know announce it to me on the Google Home and say you know there's there's some motion on the porch so if I put one of the better motion sensors out there or actually I think I just need to put it on the other side of the porch because it's battery operated I can look at it anywhere facing back toward the front door I just got to move its position and then it should be fine because it's always nice to know you know there's somebody actually on your front porch um, even if you're inside the house. Uh, let's see. And then uh, this is the that IKEA light bulb or switch that has like dimmers and scene control and so forth. It has so many functions. You could literally use this five button button for oodles and oodles of rules in your home, like levels and scenes. Um, an event one press, two, two long press, two release, three press. I mean, literally every one of these events could trigger an action. So, um, and then the other thing about um, the garden switch is like there's 
different colors one, but then there's the main one where I just, uh, let's see, where's the garden lights on? I use a wild uh, if something triggers, you can do something, but you can have the button on, and while the button is on, the garden is on. I do that with the music virtual button and the Sonos as well, so that as soon as you turn it off, then the thing goes back off. Um, and let's just create a rule from scratch, just for fun. Like, uh, I can have something where I want to um, add a certain... Let's see. I mean, literally, I could do like at a certain time, like 12:06 a.m. It could send a browser. Oh no, I didn't want Slack. I wanted a browser notification. But I could actually send Slack messages through this exact Slack channel if I I hook up the Slack API and say, you know, it's 11:06, and uh, you know, there it just fired off. It's 11.06. So that's a little browser notification. And again, I can go in there and delete my rule, my new rule, or I could just disable it. And this is the one where if the fan, uh, you know, if it's hot upstairs, uh, turn on the fan. And my earthquake alerts. And if I'm away, I can have something that, you know, Um, you know, unauthorized people are asked to leave the pre premises immediately, stuff like that. So we did some rules, some logs, some floor plan, and then the key is in the settings. So the domain, um, you get to get your own private subdomain, and it, there's a um, technology called PageKite that's used with the Raspberry Pi to tunnel in over HTTPS. There's another company, nkn.org, that has used their sort of overlay of... Uh, security that you can you don't it's decentralized you don't have to use the tunneling and you can get access remotely but basically you're, you're looking to remotely log into your gateway because none of these data are processed or stored in the cloud on the network side um, you have the option of on the raspberry pi of ethernet or wi-fi mine happens to be just wi-fi connected and it seems to work fine you can uh, enable as many user accounts as you want i'm not going to show you those you try to log into my gateway Add-ons, well, before I get to add-ons, that's the coolest thing, but localization, you can pick a number of different languages, and these languages are posted as a pontoon project, um, just like Mozilla uh, translates Firefox via this pontoon project. So we have all these different languages that people have contributed for the WebThings gateway. If you don't see the language that you speak, then contribute a language translation, and you'll be able to pick it. And temperature in units is... Uh, you know, Celsius or Fahrenheit. Uh, updates right now, I am, uh, I'm using version 0 0.11 because my demonstration of the SNPs add-on was only available up through 0.11. 0.12 is the latest release. And, um, and I've happened to have just, just last week been able to test the first instance that's uh, add-on um, beyond the developers of of the deep speech based local voice. So some of you might ask, you know, how good is the voice? Well, I've been really pleased with the SNPs add-on and, uh, um, you know, libraries that can be running on a local Raspberry Pi and nothing goes to the internet. And I'm hoping that deep speech works just as well because it's really fantastically convenient to be able to use your voice to turn things on and off. And I, you know, I'm, I'm able-bodied, but you can imagine everyone that has less mobility or, or, or anything. If they have voice, that's just a great, great thing. And I'm hoping that someday there will be the um, text-to-speech capability that I use through the Google Home. I'm hoping that will also be available as an add-on. Um, there are some uh, demos of that uh, available. It just doesn't work quite as easily for me as the Google Home. But the updates are over the air. Authorizations. Right now I have one authorization. This is a JSON token that you that you enable in the developer section. And this is allowing web to web services to exchange a secure token 
in order to get data over the API. And right now, the voice add-on that I use is the only one that uses this secure token. Uh, there's no experiments right now, but under developer for Raspberry Pi, you can enable SSH. I have it blocked to the outside, but internally I can lock, I can SSH into my gateway. Uh, you can view internal logs. It will show you a list of the logs, and you can click on them. And you can uh, create local authorizations. Again, I'm not going to do that, but basically what happens is when you do that, you get to select, do you want that third party to be able to monitor or just moni monitor and control or just monitor and then for which things. And when you apply that, it will, it will boom, it will create a uh, JSON token and actually shows you code snippets of using it in Rust and Node and Java and different JavaScript, different languages. So that's pretty cool. I think that's mostly what you see under settings. Let me think if there's anything else that I wanted to show there. And then just going back here, um, it, it's kind of fun to look at some of the internet-based data. This is the, you know, when is the high and low tide going to be today? So I can plan my rowing. Uh, what's um, Here's the pre-canned Slack messages that I have that will send me information on the Slack channel. because it might be the command parser or it might be the speech to text that was a little different. And then we can check back on the weather. And you know, you could have smart gardening that you could key off of internet data, not necessarily all local data. If you don't have a sensor for the wind, you could just pull it off of the internet. Um, let's see. And then earthquakes, too bad there isn't one active while we're doing this, but it's really fun to see where they're occurring and the magnitude and the distance from my house. So it's all kind of focused on me and the preferences that I give in the add-on itself. So one more thing I wanted to show you then is the add-ons. So if you look at the add-ons, the date time adapter, really useful, says who created it and what the license is. And then when I configure this one, I just have to include a latitude, longitude, and some other information. And so like, for example, if you like the Google text, home text to speech one, which I find very fun, if you click on that link, it will take you to the GitHub account for that or whatever account it is. It'll get, take you to the source code and then there will be usage for how to, you know, how to use it better. And for example, the, the Slack integration again is there. And oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to click this. So you could see the, again, the readme for how to integrate messages to, to go to Slack. And then, you know, I use that for my smart home capability, you know, so no matter where I am, those data will be pushed out to the gateway through the Slack connector and, and I get these alerts no matter where I am. home uh, and I have Wemo and TP-Link. I'm not using any Z-Wave at the moment, but uh, but if you click plus and see the add-ons, this again shows you who created Philippe Koval and the license. They're all open source licenses. And if you want to add it to your gateway because you have those devices, then you, you just click add. Some have configurations that you need upon, um, to build upon that, but they're all, at least I found to be very straightforward. So as I just scan this list, you can see all the fun. Counter is a fun one. You want to count how many times the doors open and close during the day. I used that one time. It was fun. And every time I log in here, quite honestly, I see new things like the display toggle. If you want to turn a Raspberry Pi touch screen that's attached to your gateway on and off, you could have a display toggle, toggle uh, thing. And uh, then you could probably use your voice to say, you know, turn on the display. And so, the, the new voice controller is going to be, hey, web things is what you'll say. 
Um, I use the earthquake monitor. You can have it send email to you. There's uh, lots of devices you can build on your own and including uh, the Microbox add-on. So I don't use Microbox so much with my own home gateway, but I use it a lot just on my desk in my office. And I'll get to that one eventually. There's a Frontier Silicon Internet Radio. There's another Internet Radio one. So you can stream radio stations through your gateway. Uh, anything that has this little notification of a bell, those are notification add-ons. You'd set up a rule, some event or some change of property state occurs, and it will send you these notifications. All of HomeKit, by the way, if you buy devices that are HomeKit capable, I find they're a little bit more expensive, but I've heard the quality is quite good. So you buy anything that uh, supports HomeKit and be sure, like some devices like the Philips Hue or the IKEA Gateway, I think there's add-ons where you can actually use both the commercial hub and the Mozilla Gateway. HomeKit, as far as I understand, is not like that. You have to pick, you're using Apple's HomeKit hub or you're using the Mozilla Web Things Gateway. Um, let's see. Insteon Devices, Internet Radio, Cody Lamed, LG WebOS TV. There's a, several devices that support that WebOS. And Matrix Chat was one that Christian Paul just recently added. He works at Matrix. Um, Mozilla uses Matrix for its chat capability. Microblox, this again is one of my favorites because now I can turn all of these little microcontrollers into web things using this add-on. And, and actually Microblox supports native web things, which is way down at the bottom. Let me just show you. Um, Oops, under W, web thing. So this is the native web thing support. So if you program in, um, let me show you all of these these types of devices, the M5 stack and the M5 stick and the M5 Atom and anything ESP8266 or ESP32 based, they directly support this stuff um, with the web thing API, which is just really super cool. So you just plug in the SSID and password of your Wi-Fi uh, in, in a Wi-Fi block in these to pr program these things, and then they, you connect them up as web things. Um, Wemo devices I find really clunky on the provisioning side. Once you get them set up, they tend to work okay. So anyway, the, the, the add-on community I think is just phenomenal. And a lot of devices, so, Xiaomi, IKEA, smart things, all of these things that are uh, um, Zigbee based, they all, they're all accommodated by the Zigbee adapter. So you don't need to look for an IKEA adapter or a specific Samsung adapter. Okay, I'm spending way too much time on the gateway and I need to come and answer some questions because I didn't actually get to microblocks. One more thing I want to show you is here's microblocks. Here's my uh, micro bit, and I can just go in here and say open. There's a Mozilla Web Things category, and I can say, okay, you know, make make a heart rate monitor, um, and it will load an example. And I can turn this. You can just see that it's heart rate. It's a multi-level sensor. It's got a number of property. It starts, and then if I run this it will blink 60 beats a minute. And if I push button A, it goes lower, push button A, it goes higher. And all it is is these variables over here, the beats per minute and the interval that gets exchanged, just the beats per minute actually that gets exchanged with the gateway. And I just wanted to, to say that Microblocks totally rocks because it's a live programming language. So if you just click on a block, it actually happens in real time and clear the display. All right, all right, so I'm gonna jump into questions. Um, and I will continue to do the Q&A on the track in Slack. So let me just, uh, the, the privacy is critical, just how good is the voice? It's gonna get better and you know, it's not perfect. It won't be as good as Alexa or Google Home. Um, somebody else asked about OpenHab. I haven't actually personally used OpenHab. I watched somebody else who uses it. 
But why is web things, Mozilla did things differently because they didn't want to force someone into one language and the add-ons you can write in any language. And the web is really any language. Uh, so those were the questions that I got asked on the Q&A there. And I welcome you to go over to the, um, to the chat channel and we'll just take it from there on the Slack chat. Hope that works for everyone. Thanks for your time. We'll see you on chat. And let's see. <laughs> is my actual is my email actually first dot last? No, it's not. It's my first name dot my last name at gmail.com. <laughs> Um, I don't know if this is still live, but I can, I can look at Slack channel questions and answer them. The sensors I use, Xiaomi, Samsung, SmartThings, Ikea for the battery operated stuff, the powered stuff really doesn't matter. Um, and then there's a link to the tutorial if you want to do it yourself in the Slack channel. And I hope you all get a chance to give it a try. It's really a great project. And I still don't know if this is going live. Are we still live?